people of medieval Europe called it the Great Pestilence. A terrifying and bewildering sickness from the east, which brought delirium and an agonizing death. Fear and hysteria gripped the land, and as the death toll mounted, it became apparent that no one was safe and no one could offer protection. As the sickness raced across Europe, communities struggled simply to bury their dead. And they sought answers, someone to blame, or a means to appease God's wrath. This was the Black Death, the greatest biological disaster in the history of mankind. To those engulfed by the madness and death, it seemed the end of the world. At the dawn of the 14th century, medieval Europe is riding a long streak of prosperity. Europe has had three, maybe four centuries of really good times. Um, the church has been strong, various kingdoms have been strong, uh, trade has grown, cities have grown, um, industry has grown, there haven't been any natural catastrophes, weather's been nice, population's been growing. It's really been a nice time for Europe. <laughs> but unknowingly, Europe stands on the brink of its greatest crisis. Suddenly, there is a subtle shift in the climate as temperatures fall. Europe's overstretched resources fail. There is famine and war. The Golden Age has ended, and a more dreadful reality confronts the continent. The four horsemen of the apocalypse have come. Famine hits, plague hits, war is all over, and death is all over. In the 1340s, war ravages the continent. The deepening crisis hits peasants hard, but there were some who thrived on warfare. Edward III has ruled England for 20 years. Now he seeks to enforce his claim on the throne of France and leads an army into Normandy. He wins a spectacular victory at Crecy before wresting control of Calais from his rival, Philip VI of France. Edward controls a sizable portion of France, but his early advantage will only lead to a protracted war. This is the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, and of, uh, which, which is really a world war as far as the Europeans are concerned. It involves everywhere. Spain, Germany, Italy, France, England. King Edward promises his daughter Joan to Pedro, the Prince of Spanish Castile. Like most royal marriages in medieval Europe, it is not a match born out of love, but of diplomatic ambition. For a marriage between the two royal families will secure Edward III a powerful ally in his war against the King of France. Barely into her teens, Joan has never met her fiancé, nor has she ever been to Spain. Like any young girl, Joan hopes her father has chosen a handsome prince, perhaps even a kind one. <laughs> 400 miles to the south, in Avignon, France, Pope Clement VI, God's representative on earth, considers his own prospects. For more than a thousand years, the Holy Catholic Church has been the center of religious authority in Europe. The religion of a medieval person was their life. Uh, it surrounded them. They thought nothing of going to church every day. Their life consisted a lot of uh, blessings which they attributed to God and cursings which they kind of attributed to God too, although they blamed it on their sins. So their whole life was the, enveloped in this religious atmosphere. 
But in the 14th century, the church's moral authority is under attack. Priests were coming under a lot of criticism for abusing their power. We have lots of examples of priests who had concubines, priests who slept with women in the village, priests who were considered uh, corrupt. Even the Pope seems tainted. The French have hijacked the papacy, moving it from Rome to Avignon. The break with tradition seems to suit Clement VI, a worldly man who enjoys his opulent lifestyle, but it scandalizes the faithful. Despite the skeptics, Clement's word still carries authority. But will it be enough to sustain his flock when their world comes crashing in? The man who will prove to be his most trusted and courageous advisor is his personal physician, Guy de Choliac. He's the medical practitioner of great renown. He had been in court medical circles since uh, the reign of Philip the Fair around the turn of the 14th century, and now he is the attending physician, so to speak, of the Pope. In de Choliac's world, religion rules science. So entwined are the two that most doctors are also clerics, and the answers to many medical mysteries are thought to lie within theology. But neither his medical texts nor his Bible will prepare de Choliac for the horror to come. Far to the east, on the Mongolian steppes, something terrible has awakened, an invisible agent of death. <coughs> Rumors fly that all of humanity is being wiped out in China, India, and the Islamic world. Interestingly enough, these rumors of origins in the East are accompanied by apocalyptic descriptions of the plague's origins. There were miraculous events that occurred, a rain of frogs, uh, serpents, and so forth. Uh, there was a hail of, uh, a, a rain of hail and thunder and lightning. And then finally, stinking smoke and thunder fell from the heavens. <coughs> Before 1347, the Mongols seemed unstoppable. Their dominion over the East has lasted nearly 150 years in an empire stretching from the peaks of Tibet to beyond the Volga River and from Beijing to Constantinople. Essentially, they opened up trade between Western Europe and uh, China. People could essentially follow routes that went through Central Asia, so that the second half of the 13th century in particular was a time for expansion of European trade toward the East. But as new opportunities are created for trade, at the same time, Europe is opened up to new unforeseen dangers. We have uh, very valuable goods and cargo, such as spices and silk. Uh, passing along this, this overland route opened up by the Mongols through their unified empire. But of course, another commodity would have been plague. Relentlessly, the pestilence creeps across the steppes, wiping out whole villages, the bodies swollen with malignant sores. In this harsh wilderness, nothing goes to waste. Valuable goods like furs and blankets are always salvaged. The rest is torched, an attempt to kill the evil that caused this tragedy. But the unseen demon travels with the loot. In 1347, thousands of miles to the west in the bustling trade city of Geneva, a servant prepares to make a dangerous journey. In a society defined by the doctrines of the Christian church, he is already at risk. 
His name is Agimet, and he is a Jew. Jews had to have the explicit invitation and permission of the king to be in a town. They were, in a way that no other medieval person was, owned and directly dependent upon the king or a great noble like a bishop. At his lord's bidding, Agamet will venture 300 miles across the Alps to Venice, where he can purchase luxuries which are unavailable in the common market stalls of his home. But his expedition also takes him into the darkest events of history. In England, 500 miles to the northwest, a rider is approaching the end of another daunting journey. A troubadour, he has traveled for weeks all the way from Spain. He is a gift from the Prince of Castile, sent to amuse his betrothed, the English Princess Joan. He will sing her songs of love on her wedding voyage to Castile, a romantic gesture for the pleasure of a young girl. <laughs> on the way to Castile, Joan and her entourage plan to stop at Bordeaux, one of many towns in France ruled by her father, the King of England. She is a favorite amongst Edward III's children. Now, on the eve of her voyage, she can have little expectation of seeing her father or England again. She will travel with distinguished clergymen and lords and a guard of 100 bowmen, but their precautions will come to nothing. Within a year, almost all of them will be dead. Even now, the invasion has begun, carried on the lowly backs of small stowaways. A ticking bomb, it will bring this beautiful world crashing down. Trade routes opened by the Mongol Empire now encourage the spread of goods, people, and pestilence into the heart of Europe. Travelers on the road, peasants in the field, and even the daughter of the King of England are all speeding towards an encounter with the greatest killer in the history of mankind, the Black Death. At the end of the Asian trade route slides the port city of Kaffa on the Black Sea, where Italian merchants exchange goods from east and west. In 1346, the Mongols attack the Christian city of Kaffa, hoping to take this prosperous seaport for themselves. At first, it seems as if the town will fall to the relentless assault. But in the midst of the siege, the Mongols are suddenly attacked by a virulent new enemy, plague. It inspires them to launch a final desperate plan. The Mongols got the plague and had to call off the siege. But before they left, they decided to catapult their dead corpses, their dead bodies of their victims into the town in order to, quote, extinguish everyone inside and give the plague to their enemies. And apparently this is how the plague was communicated by the Mongols to Europeans. It is one of the earliest recorded attempts at biological warfare. While the story might be more legend than fact, the Mongol pestilence spreads to the townspeople of Kaffa. The plague is fairly slow moving for an epidemic disease. In 15 years, given the, the, the vast stretches of the, the steppe and, and the thinness of the population, would be about the right time to get it to Kafo. But what happens next is very different. Compared to its slow progress across Asia, the plague is about to conquer Europe in the blink of an eye. It was the busy sea lanes, vital to Europe's prosperity, that were the cause. The plague travels by merchant ships, and the island of Sicily is its first port of call.
To the people of the shore and inlets of Italy, the waves have always delivered up the odds and ends of the Mediterranean storms. But this year, something different washes ashore. Ah! Oh, my God! Andiamocene via! Andiamocene! Aspettami, aspettami! And in the towns, ships from the Black Sea sail into harbor, bearing something foul. Below decks, the Italians find a cargo of corpses. The few survivors are reported to have sickness clinging to their very bones. Mio Dio, che male è questo? When the townspeople realize the danger, they order the ships to leave their harbor. But it is too late. The plague has already taken hold. The first signs of the sickness seem like many common illnesses. They give little indication of the horror that is to come. Initially, it would have been difficult to tell uh, the, the, the early symptoms of Black Death from a very heavy flu-like, what we would consider to be flu-like symptoms. Um, fevers, chills and a high temperature. And then there would be a second stage where there would be development of the welts, the swelling of the buboes. <coughs> the bubo is a painfully enlarged lymph gland around the armpit, groin or neck. They become purple and can swell to the size of an orange. It is these telltale buboes that indicate that the cause of the Black Death was bubonic plague. It's spread, I mean, very, very rapid. It can cause septic shock. Uh, you know, blood pressure will drop very rapidly. Uh, see multi-organ failure. The vascular system can become leaky and you can have hemorrhaging. The buboes themselves are very, very painful. It's a very awful way to die. <laughs> people of the Sicilian town of Messina soon discover that this new disease is not only agonizing and deadly, but also highly contagious. It spreads quickly within families, sowing terror in every quarter. This more or less struck out of the blue, and nobody had seen anything like this. So these people were like, uh, they were like Columbus is in the land of mass death. That's just what they were like. As the plague rages through Messina, the survivors have only one place to turn, the Holy Mother of God. <laughs> Those still able to walk, trek to her shrine six miles away and carry her back to the city. Santa Madre, proteggici da questa malattia in nome di Cristo. Despite their desperate pleas, the Virgin refuses to help them according to the Italian chronicler Michele di Piazza. The arrival of the statue profited nobody. The Messines were so loath and feared that no man would speak to them or be in their company, but hastily fled at the sight of them, holding his breath. The visibility of the disease, it marks an individual out as having that disease, and that's very, that's very important in terms of creating a social stigma. Though the Sicilians shun their Messinese neighbors, they cannot outrun the disease. The mark of sickness leaps across the island with startling speed. But this is just the beginning. Genoese ships from Caffer and Constantinople are landing on the Italian mainland. They bear furs, textiles, and rats, all fine purveyors of the infected flea. Like an avenging angel, the plague will sweep across an unsuspecting continent as the Black Death is unleashed.
Europe now faces the greatest threat in its history. Swift and deadly, it seems to come from nowhere and everywhere. It has reached the shores of Italy, and the people are utterly defenseless. For medieval science is mired in a fog of superstition and ignorance. Guy de Chauliac is surgeon to Philip VI, King of France, as well as Pope Clement VI, who resides in Avignon, in southern France. Renowned for his great intellect, he has been trained by the best physicians in Europe at the monastery in Montpellier. His techniques, like bleeding with leeches, are all designed to restore balance to the body. There actually were medical theories about the balances of elements, about uh, what kind of balance the body needs in order to stay healthy. And the plague, from a medical point of view, was seen above all as a reversal of all the normal balances. Coincidentally, an unusual alignment of planets directly precedes the outbreak. To the medieval mind, it is the obvious explanation for what's happening. The conjunction of the three planets, Jupiter, Mars and Saturn, that created um, noxious vapours within the air. And it was these noxious vapours that interacted with the individual constitution uh, that caused somebody to succumb to the plague. This was the miasmatic explanation, or that the plague came from a miasma, uh, uh, an evil vapour. And I should emphasise that these explanations were not new. They were very old. Being old, these theories are also deeply entrenched. And so it is difficult for the medical community to depart from this way of thinking. But away from the intellectual theorizing of the courts, the common people have a more simple explanation for the plague. They've been brought up to believe that like blessings, Curses all ultimately flow from God. In the Middle Ages, the entire logic of the relationship between a God and the world involved God's punishing the world when the world sinned. The punishment is well deserved, according to contemporary Italian chronicler Gabriele de Musis. <laughs> Almighty God saw the entire human race wallowing in the mire of manifold wickedness, enmeshed in a wrongdoing, pursuing numberless vices, drowning in a sea of depravity because of a limitless capacity for evil. We now know that it was not sin or evil that brought on the Black Death. It was a contagious disease. But the evidence offered by contemporary chroniclers is, some historians and scientists argue, inconclusive. 600 years on, the cause of the Black Death is still debated. What the key question becomes is how those diseases become transmitted and propagated, and what is it in society that enables a set of different causes of death to emerge at one point in time. For more than a century, the main theory has been that the Black Death was caused by bubonic plague. Caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis, it is carried in the stomach of fleas and requires a very particular environment to flourish. Medieval Europe appears to fit the bill. Urban centers, garbage on the streets, tremendous milieu in which to breed huge rat populations. And with those huge rat populations, huge flea populations. A single flea bite injects the victim with the Yersinia pestis bacteria. They quickly multiply in the lymph nodes, which are filled to bursting by the infection. Once released into the bloodstream, the bacteria attacks the organs, causing internal hemorrhaging. 
And there is another, even deadlier form of the disease that kills 95% of those infected. It's called pneumonic plague, and it doesn't need a rat or flea to get around. In some instances, the bacteria will go to the lungs and lodge there and begin to proliferate. If you cough and you have also hemorrhaging in the lungs from the bacteria, you can get what's called a bloody sputum where your spit has blood, flecks of blood in it. And if you're coughing, those respiratory droplets can be quite infectious and then you can infect another person. <coughs> the environmental conditions and disease symptoms vividly described by contemporaries indicate the Black Death was a bubonic plague pandemic. But some scientists continue to dispute this. They point to one puzzling feature of the disease, the shocking speed with which it spread. It basically spread across Europe, Western Europe, within four or five years. It's an incredibly rapid spread, considering that they didn't have trains, planes, automobiles, uh, that the transportation was by foot or by horseback. I mean, it's a very, very rapid spread of the disease. Many doubt bubonic plague could travel so fast. The speed at which the disease spread around communities isn't consistent with what we know about bubonic plague. So this has led some historians to suggest that perhaps there was another causal mechanism involved, there was another epidemic disease involved. Uh, perhaps one suggestion has been the spread of anthrax. Uh, other authors have suggested it might have been an Ebola-like virus. There are clear differences here in relation to the way in which disease is spread. Recent research has gone further towards identifying bubonic plague as the culprit. Europe's busy coastal waterways meant infected fleas and rats could move quickly around the continent, establishing new bases for the disease. And now, cutting-edge science is lending its weight to the argument. In Montpellier, a 650-year-old mass grave is giving modern technology the chance to finally resolve the argument. A team of French archaeologists is exhuming the bodies of plague victims. Black death studies are, are, are still young. It used to be thought black death couldn't get anything out of a skeleton. It was a tissue disease. All we have are the bones. Couldn't get anything from it. Uh, now with DNA, with some of the other things that we can get out of uh, bones, there's some possibilities. It's still very, very controversial, but there's some possibilities that we might learn more and more. The researchers are mining for biological treasure, the teeth of plague victims. Like a locked box, a tooth seals in the DNA of organisms traveling in the bloodstream at the time of death, including perhaps the very agent of death. On a trouvé quelque chose, je crois que c'est important, les dents sont entières. They took the teeth out of the skulls, then they examined the tooth pulp for evidence of the uh, presence of the plague bacteria, Yersinia pestis. And according to their um, results, these sequences were obviously Yersinia pestis DNA, but they were somewhat unique. And it provided the only really objective evidence that we have that the Black Death might indeed have been caused by Yersinia pestis. The French results bring the mystery of the plague one step closer to its solution. But before these results can be considered conclusive, more work needs to be done and more graves need to be investigated. To Guy de Choliac, the eminent 14th century physician, the concepts of deadly fleas and bacterial DNA would sound as alien as ill-crossed stars and God's wrath sound to us today. <coughs> By the autumn of 1347, the Black Death has conquered Sicily, causing death and despair. It is a disaster without precedence, as if God himself has forsaken the people. <coughs> In 
in Venice. Agimet, the Jewish servant of a Swiss lord, finds all that his master desires, saffron and cinnamon, castor and camphor, silks and furs, and more besides. For late in the year, merchant ships are arriving from the east. They bring the Black Death to Venice. Gabriella de Musis, an Italian notary who lives through the dark days that follow, gives voice to the horror of the sailors who have unwittingly brought the catastrophe home. To our anguish, we were carrying the darts of death. We were spreading a poison from our lips even as we spoke. Of course, they didn't have any idea that the plague was spread by a bacterium, by a microscopic organism that can't be seen by the naked eye. But they did have a, um, a sense and a knowledge that the plague could be spread from person to person. As Agamet heads back to Geneva, the world behind him begins to fall apart. Venetians are dying at the astonishing rate of 600 a day. In September 1347, the plague enters France through ships trading at Marseille. Merchant ships carrying the infection sail to Spain. In Barcelona, about 60% of the population is thought to have perished. You could imagine a person, let's say a sailor, working in the dock area, being bitten by an infectious flea. They would get on their ship and then they could travel on their ship. And they wouldn't become sick for, again, two to six days. So there's the potential for people to move around, move from one area to another before becoming ill. Of course, this same ship may have rats with infectious rat fleas. And then when the ship reaches a port, those rats and their fleas can get off and spread the disease as well. In spring, the Black Death travels up the Rhone River to Avignon, where the Pope resides. Vignolin, je vous en supplie. La maladie frappe à la porte. Docteur, notre permis est protégé. Though Guy de Choliac urges him to flee, Clement VI refuses to leave his palace. By August 1348, the plague reaches Paris. Half its population will die. When it reaches Bordeaux, Princess Joan, the daughter of King Edward III, has just arrived from her sea journey. She will rest at the royal estate for a while and then continue to Castile and her prince. Joan is perhaps the most well-guarded woman in Europe but archers and castle walls cannot protect her from the unseen enemy. No, no, no! Vous ne pouvez pas passer ici! No! C'est très dangereux pour la princesse! The pestilence seems to strike at random, wiping out some households but sparing others. Even before it sows destruction, it breeds terror. There was nothing they could do. And it's that sense of facing an event over which you have absolutely no power that makes it a dr such a dramatic event in human history. I've often tried to imagine what it must have felt like to hear that in the town across the mountains, 75% of the people had just died. And they did hear, they received letters before the plague came. They knew the plague was coming in many places. So they had time to think about what's gonna happen when it gets here. And I, I can't really imagine uh, a scarier thought. Consumed by fear, many of the gentry flee, leaving the less fortunate to fend for themselves. What we see in, in literature are these cowardly figures, the, the rich who are going into the countryside and who are, who are there frightened um, by their own mortality. So who's left behind? Who is back in town suffering but the poor and those who are unable to do what the rich can? 
In England, Edward III and his eldest son retreat to a country estate, bolting the gates behind them. But there's no such refuge for the serfs who farm the land. It was in the villages that mortality was at its highest, and the peasants died in droves. People lived in, in, in extreme poverty, and they lived in huts uh, with thatched roofs. Uh, they had livestock living in very close association with them. They had dirt floors to the huts. Uh, the, the, thing, the living conditions were absolutely filthy. The types of environments where you'd expect rats and rat fleas to proliferate and do quite well. As conditions worsen, the church seems to fail its flock. Fearing contamination, some priests refuse to administer last rites to the dying. For many medieval people, to die without last rites is a more terrifying prospect than death itself. But as the death toll mounts and more priests succumb to the plague, the Bishop of Bath and Wells makes a startling suggestion. If they are on the point of death and cannot secure the services of a priest, then they should make confession to each other, to a layman, or if no man is present, even to a woman. In these grim days, many abandon old loyalties for the sake of survival. Not even family ties can bind the healthy to the sick, as one of the great writers of the age, Giovanni Boccaccio, witnesses. Relatives were cared for, not otherwise than dogs. They threw them their food and drink by the bed, and then they fled the household. One person would get sick first, the family might start to take care of them, maybe friends would come and help, but then others in the family would get sick, and you can imagine that very quickly people would abandon any attempt to help each other. When you have every third person dying, this of course is going to affect people's outlook and mentality. One of the responses would be fear, am I going to be next? Uh, is the plague going to strike me? Can I get the plague even from my father, my brother, my sister? The lack of compassion appalls Agnolo di Tura, a citizen of Siena. Father abandoned child, wife, husband, one brother, another. For this illness seemed to strike through breath and sight. And so they died. The death rates were so high that it basically people's faith was shocked or rocked to the core. Uh, many of the teachings they'd been given by the church didn't seem to give them any comfort or uh, seem to be applicable to the situation. Uh, I mean, everyone was dying. Um, it didn't seem to make any sense. The fabric of medieval society is being torn apart. People begin to turn to extremists for answers. This was uh, God's vengeance on humans for their wickedness and sin. Uh, what better way to respond to that than by an extraordinary penance that would take away that sin. Their origins are obscure and legendary. Religious zealots who whip themselves mercilessly to atone for the world's sins. Their fanaticism would lead the crowds further into hysteria, persecution, and mass murder. By 1348, the Black Death has traveled from Sicily to England, carried in trade ships aboard the backs of rats. Already it has claimed the lives of millions. In every village, at every farm, the corpses pile up in staggering numbers. Communities face a new crisis, how to dispose of the dead. If you lose 10% of 95,000 people, think about that, that's 10,000 people. 
how do you bury 10,000 people that have been lost in a very short period of time? Where do you find the, the, the people to, to take them? Where do you find the people to, where do you find the carts to take them? The only people who were willing to carry away the dead were these very rustic, uncouth uh, men or women who came down from the mountains or from the surrounding countryside who were willing for very high fees to take away the dead and have contact with the dead. The smells must have been very difficult and p people tried to accommodate that by having fires and you know, having sweet smells around. They tried to cover up the smell of death. But you can only go so far with that. In the spring of 1349, graves must be found for nearly 300 people a day in London. Avignon, where the papal court resides, is devastated. In one six-week period, 11,000 people are buried in a single graveyard. It is said the Pope was finally driven to consecrate the River Rhone, in which countless bodies are dumped through necessity. In Italy, too, traditional burial rites have to be abandoned. They were laid like layers of a lasagna. They would put the bottom layer, sprinkle a little dirt, a second layer, sprinkle a little dirt, third layer, sprinkle dirt. In Siena, in the Tuscany region of Italy, the death toll is so high that work has to be abandoned on the city's new cathedral. Agnolo de Tura, a resident of Siena, raises a lament that has lost none of its poignancy after six and a half centuries. In many places, great pits were dug and piled deep with the multitude of the dead. And as soon as those ditches were filled, more were dug. I, Agnolo de Tura, buried my five children with my own hands. And so many died that all believed it was the end of the world. In spite of the personal risk, many courageous clerics continue to attend the dead and dying. Some doctors stop seeing patients to save themselves, not Guy de Choliac. He stayed. I think there was not just bravery, but a certain scientific curiosity there. He wanted to see what this great blazing demon was and how it worked. Gita Choliac seems to do what a more modern medical practitioner would do, which is he doesn't understand the disease. So he takes part in, in helping individuals with the disease until he gets it, and then he writes about it. In his remarkable journal, the careful surgeon catalogues the symptoms of the disease, its different forms, and the treatments which seem to be most effective. In the summer of 1348, Guy de Choliac, still adhering to the theory of an invisible poisonous vapor, prescribed fire itself to Pope Clement VI. Great basins of oil and wood are set ablaze on either side of the Pope's throne, a fortress of flames against the ravages of the plague. It gives us this image of the Pope running from society, so to speak, sequestered in an interior room that is now blazing um, hot with fires uh, um, built up around him. Clements formed his own hell, if you will, in order to, to uh, keep, uh, keep out of plague's reach. And if your dominant medical theory of disease causation is the miasmas and the bad vapors in the air, then if the smoke given off by the fire has a purifying effect, then clearly that makes some sort of sense uh, in terms of um, warding off infection. The Pope, helped by his isolation and some luck, survives the plague. But Princess Joan, favorite daughter of the King of England, does not. Like millions around her in Europe, she falls victim to the Black Death. 
Her father, Edward III, is powerless to do anything but mourn. Destructive death, who seizes young and old alike, has lamentably snatched from us our dearest daughter, whom we loved best of all. All the trappings of authority have just disappeared, and you see one human being, one grieving human being, and he's speaking to a, another person, and it's a voice that's immediately recognizable 700 years later, despite the trappings of authority. All the traditional elites of medieval Europe, church and secular, appear powerless. And so the masses turn elsewhere for salvation. In the German Rhineland, a form of mass hysteria erupts, which threatens to undermine the authority of the Catholic Church. They are known as the Brotherhood of the Flagellants, fanatics who believe they can avert God's wrath by extreme physical acts of repentance. This is the revival of an old movement that had swept Italy a hundred years before, an extreme reaction to a world turned upside down. And the people flock to them. People looked upon the flagellants as helping to ward off the disease, as perhaps uh, their extraordinary penance might avert God's wrath and take away the plague. The notion of flagellating oneself might have a particular appeal, a very dramatic method of, a painful dramatic method of scourging oneself of the sins in the expectation that you might not be alive tomorrow. In groups as large as a thousand men, the flagellants commit themselves to a master for 33 and a half days to mark their savior's years on earth. Forsaking bath, bed and sex, they march from town to town, performing gruesome masochistic acts before appreciative throngs. In his journals, the French chronicler Jean de Venette writes, The penitents scorched themselves with whips of hard-knotted leather with little iron spikes. Some made themselves bleed very badly between the shoulder blades, and some foolish women had clothes ready to catch the blood and smear it on their eyes, saying it was miraculous blood. Pope Clement VI, however, feels threatened by their growing influence. The flatulents were suspected by uh, the organized religious establishment. Uh, their coming to a place often created a lot of commotion, and sometimes it was accompanied by even uh, movements against the town authorities or uh, other groups. Religious reform, too. As the plague progressed, one senses that, that all the institutions in medieval society, including most notably the church, had were shown to be as, the plague showed them to be as powerless as, you know, they, they were just like everyone else, as, as the poorest peasant. Wherever they travel, the flagellants provoke an outpouring of religious fervor. The medieval masses are desperate for a miracle to save them. That's what the flagellant processions and the sermons that attended them created. This moment of heightened, messianic, apocalyptic, now is the time expectation. In 1348, as the plague engulfs Europe, mankind adds his own brand of viciousness to the disaster that surrounds him. Shock gives way to a witch hunt. Someone must be responsible for this catastrophe, and they should pay. In a torrent of hysteria and fear, the crowds target the defenseless and innocent in a murderous rampage. In 1348, the Black Death is at its height. 
it has cut a path of destruction from Sicily to England. Convinced that God is punishing the world for its wickedness, the towns set out to purge themselves of all forms of sin. The first thing they would do is pass urban reform ordinances. No gambling, no swearing. Put the prostitutes out in a house in the countryside. Clean up your act. Maybe that will avert the plague. Bene, bene, bene. Questo non deve succedere mai più. E voi, seguiteci. Per voi e per le ragazze è tempo di prendere una vacanza. In many towns like Pestoia, Italy, town fathers pass emergency measures to combat the spread of the plague. Ordinanza numero 3. I cadaveri non potranno essere rimossi dal luogo della morte prima che vengano chiusi in una cassa di legno. Ordinanza numero 5. Che nessuno abbia l'ardire di portare cadaveri all'interno della città. Ordinanza numero 30. Durante i funerali le campane non potranno essere più suonate. Funerals have been stripped down to their bare essentials. Death has become not just familiar, but monotonous. There are so many people dying that you might have a priest might be leading one procession, uh, a procession of one person to a grave, and then he would look behind him and he would see 10 more that he would have to accompany to their grave. So there was a mass death, uh, so much death in fact that people in a sense became inured to it or hardened to it, uh, that now funerals became the occasion of witticisms and jollification. In Germany, the sense of impending doom gives birth to an extreme and violent religious movement. The Brotherhood of the Flagellants. The Flagellants brutal form of penitence, complete with the suggestion of holy blood, creates a sensation as they travel through a countryside empty of hope. Their dramatic displays are far more compelling than the ineffectual mutterings of the village priest. If they are not welcomed by the local church, the flagellants can react with furious outrage. Believing their bloody sacrifice earns them God's grace, Flagellants even claim to perform Christ-like miracles. Some flagellants believed that uh, dead babies or dead children could be revived in their midst. Uh, there's also a famous story of a cow talking as a, as a miracle uh, ascribed to the flagellants. Along the Rhine, it seems as if miracles are being performed, while in Avignon, France, the very heart of Christendom, at its height, the plague kills 400 a day. Pope Clement VI knows the flagellants pose a dangerous threat to his authority but his cardinals urge him not to do anything hasty. They fear an attack on the movement at the peak of its popularity could cause a backlash against the church itself. There's an interesting dynamic between the popular attitude towards the flagellants and the authorities' attitude towards the flagellants. The authorities tended to take a hostile stance, but the people, on the other hand, seemed to have supported the flagellants, largely because they associated their arrival with a warding off or averting of the plague. For the time being, Clement will not move openly against the flagellants. But the excesses of the movement will soon prove intolerable. These processions could be experienced by 
ordinary people, ordinary Christians, as a, as a totally transformative moral experience that uplifts them and that makes them feel that they have the strength and the energy to make their city or their town a better place, whatever that takes. It may take swearing that you'll never gamble again. It may take throwing the prostitutes out of the city. It may take expelling the Jews or even burning them. The Jewish merchant Agimet has traveled hundreds of miles through regions devastated by the plague. But it will be the hatred and suspicion of man that does for him in the end. It, it's human nature, I suppose, to look for a scapegoat in times of crisis. Jews always seem to be the scapegoat, and in the Black Death they were as well. <laughs> In medieval Europe, the Jews are a distinctive and vulnerable group. In times of religious hysteria, they are often portrayed as the Antichrist. There is a whole history of blood libels against the Jews, a whole history of persecution of the Jews by Christians during the Middle Ages. Betrayed by his distinctive clothing, which marks him as a Jew, Agamet is taken to town officials for questioning. He is not alone, according to French monk and eyewitness Jean de Venet. The infection and the sudden death which it brought were blamed on the Jews, who were said to have poisoned wells and rivers and corrupted the air. Beim Beutel, den dir der Rabbiner gegeben hat. Was war denn eigentlich im Beutel drin? Ich habe keine von keinem bekommen. Lügner! Du hast Flüsse vergiftet, nicht wahr? Ich schwöre. Lügner! Lügner! After hours of torture, Agimet breaks down. He falsely confesses that a rabbi did give him a pouch filled with venom, which he used to poison wells. They were forced to confess that no Jews are innocent. All Jews are guilty. They're all part of this conspiracy. Uh, no one can be cleared of these charges. De Venet reports that confessions like Agamets fly up and down the Rhine. Accordingly, the whole world brutally rose against them. And in Jewish communities, many thousands were indiscriminately butchered, slaughtered, and burnt alive by the Christians. What's poisoning us is the Jews' presence itself. That the Jews' presence is a moral failing. It's our sin to tolerate them, and this is what's bringing this punishment. As Pope Clement VI pointed out at the time, Jews were dying in equal number to Christians, so it was fantastical to argue that Jews were poisoning people during the Black Death. The Pope's pleas fall on deaf ears. On St. Valentine's Day, 1349, the citizens of Strasbourg round up as many as 2,000 Jews and burn them in the Jewish cemetery. The atrocity is repeated in more than 15 cities in Germany and Switzerland. The people of Europe have been poisoned, not by some insidious Jewish plot, but by fear, hate, and ignorance. In Avignon, nearly all of the nobles have fled the city. Even the Pope retreats to his country estate, no longer trusting the open fires prescribed for his protection. But one member of his court does remain, the renowned physician Guy de Choliac. But the aging surgeon's final investigation of the disease comes perilously close to home. Guy de Chaliac continued to make the rounds during the plague in Avignon to the point where he himself came down with the illness. And even on his, his deathbed, he doesn't quite know what, we're, what, it, what it is that we've got. Um, but he's willing to, to help people, he's willing to try. 
De Choliac's courageous commitment to his patients has brought him to the brink of death. No one knows better than he how slim his chances of recovery are. As the heroic doctor struggles for his life in France, the flagellant movement in Germany starts to fall apart. Originally made up of pious zealots, the flagellants now attract misfits and outlaws. They hoard loot stolen from churches. Their former discipline and oaths of abstinence are ill-observed. One gets the sense from some of these stories that in some of these villages, the flagellants were almost greeted like rock stars. And that there might be what would be after flagellant parties. <laughs> the sight of the blood, the, the stripped down bodies and the sweat and the, 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 the lean muscular frames and all of that, no doubt aroused many young female peasant hearts. That and the fact that you just had so much emotion loose in that, at that moment in time. The church finally moves against them. In October 1349, Pope Clement VI issues a papal bull denouncing the flagellants and appeals to the kings of England and France. The church actually has to look to the political uh, means of stopping the flagellants. The flagellants begin to be arrested or they begin to be chased away by military officials. <laughs> Some masters, now called masters of errors, are even seized and beheaded. Wir befinden dich für schuldig. Du hast Unglauben verbreitet. Du bist zum Tode verurteilt. Soll Gott deine Seele schützen. Even with the flagellant movement broken, much of Europe remains violently hostile to the remnants of Europe's Jewish community. The survivors become refugees, searching for a safe haven. In most of Europe, France, England, large parts, many German cities, had no Jews by the end of the 14th century. They'd expelled them or killed them. Uh, but in some places, Jews were being given greater protection by monarchs and invited to settle. And one of those places is Poland. In 1349, Poland is ruled by King Casimir the Great. The legends are that he fell in love with a Jewish woman called Esterka, Esther. And it was out of love for her that he issued this bull of protection to the Jews of Poland and invited more Jews into Poland. One of the ironies is it pushed the German Jewish community toward Poland. And 700 years later, that sort of came full circle again with the same group of Germans. In the winter of 1349, the plague pushes north to the Scandinavian peninsula. By the time it reaches Russia two years later, the crisis is over in France. After wiping out around half the population of Europe, the pandemic is fitfully receding. Infectious diseases have these natural cycles that they go through until that cycle is broken, either by human agency or by, for example, a change in virulence of the infective organism itself. As the Black Death proceeded and as the humans began to die and uh, society, you know, that it was falling apart basically, um, it's possible that the human numbers drop down below a certain level and that these outbreaks can't maintain themselves. <laughs> The magnitude of the final death toll is so vast that it strains the human imagination. I think the plague was um, unprecedented in the scope of its mortality, and I'm of the opinion that the mortality was higher than most scholars are willing to accept. I believe that the average mortality was close to 50 percent not a third or 30% as, as most scholars claim. 
monasteries in particular have been devastated. 60% of Venice has been killed by the epidemic. In Avignon, half of the citizens are dead. At the monastery in Montpellier, where Guy de Choliac received his training, only seven of the 140 monks are left. England is thought to have lost nearly two million people, almost half its population. But Edward III, King of England, survives, as do most nobles who have taken shelter on secluded country estates. There's a somewhat lesser death rate among the upper classes, partly because they could um, move. They could leave an urban area, they could leave a town, they could go out. Their castles or their manor houses might provide an environment that was a little less conducive to the contagious nature of, of plague. Pope Clement VI, who deserts Avignon during the worst outbreak, is also alive and well. More amazing is the recovery of his surgeon, Guy de Choliac. His journals record his words. Towards the end of the plague, I developed a fever with a swelling in the groin. I was ill near on six weeks. When the swelling had ripened, I treated it with figs and cooked onions mixed with yeast and butter. I escaped by God's grace. Oh, C'est un miracle, mon ami. Il faut que nous allons prier. For Guy de Choliac and every other survivor, it is a changed, emptier world than before. Ibn Khaldun, a 14th century Arab historian, fears that evil times are ahead. The plague swallowed up many of the good things of civilization and wiped them out. The entire world changed. Think about the impact of losing 15 million people, what that does to society, what that must have done to the church, what that must have done to, to science, to medicine, uh, to art, to literature. What if you lost a Da Vinci in there? What if you lost a Leonardo? What if you lost uh, a Michelangelo because of the Black Death? You can look almost anywhere and see the traces of this loss of a third, a half of humanity. Well, I read one tombstone that said, uh, he died in the year when scarcely a quarter of humanity was left on Earth. This sense that you're part of a fragment, 25% remaining, that's it. Most have had to watch helplessly as a loved one died in agony. Each community struggles with the impact of countless, heart-rending personal tragedies. The sorrow and isolation devastate the Italian poet Petrarch. Consider what we were and what we are. Where are our dear friends now? Where are the beloved faces? There was a crowd of us. Now we are almost alone. But for some, rather than sorrow, the plague brings the joy of survival and the opportunity for looting, drinking, and lechery. In the empty houses of the dead, wild excesses overflow. Giù le mani da lei! Quella è la mia donna! Maiale! Florentine historian Matteo Villani is full of dismay. Men gave themselves to the most disordered and sordid behavior more than ever before. They rushed headlong into lust. Still, the vast majority of survivors neither sink into despair nor wallow in excess. Most simply try to get on with the process of living. They never lose faith in God or, even more remarkably, their faith in the future. Medieval people also had the assumption 
that God would make all things right, that God had a plan, uh, that the apocalypse would uh, set things right in the end, or that there would be a renewal, a restoration, that this was not simply the end, there would be something that would come beyond. What's amazing in a way is how quickly these societies renormalized, reroutinized, became functioning societies again. Faith encourages many not just to carry on, but actually to go forth and multiply, according to French chronicler Jean de Venet. When the epidemic was over, the men and women still alive married each other. Everywhere, women conceived more readily than usual. But this is no return to a lost golden age. For even as Europe tries to recover, chaos erupts once more. The old mold has been smashed, and the new one will be shaped at the point of a sword. The Black Death is a human catastrophe without comparison. Centuries of population growth in Europe are halted and abruptly thrown into reverse. The death toll is in the millions. When in European history has there ever been an event where possibly 50% of the entire population died in such a quick time? It's an event like this which we can barely wrap our minds around. How is it that you can wake up one morning and be dead by the evening? For the survivors, death now seems a closer companion. The plague brings everyone face to face with their own mortality. I've often wondered whether the sense of despair and the sense of irrationality with regard to what has happened opened up minds to questioning questioning authority, but questioning how we understand God, and questioning to what degree there is an authority that we can all turn to. And the old authority, the church, remains, but faces new challenges. Many nobles now prefer to worship in seclusion. Some families began to hire private chaplains, so that there seems to be a kind of privatizing of religion that takes place. The plague fires the faith of many. Others look for new answers in science. In Avignon, plague survivor Guy de Choliac is driven to write his masterpiece, The Chirurgia Magna, or Great Surgery. He bases it not on ancient philosophy and astrology, but upon his own observations of disease. It becomes a standard reference work for the next 300 years. <coughs> the plague had an important impact in the, in the practice of medicine because when the plague arrived, the, the university trained physician was basically an internist and didn't do really any, any clinical medicine. His knowledge of medicine was all theoretical. After the debacle of the plague, medicine became increasingly more practical. In the Italian countryside, another transformation is taking place. Prior to the plague, famine was a constant danger. Though every inch of land was sowed, supplies struggled to meet the soaring demand. Now, even with much of the land gone fallow, there is food to spare. Arable land is plentiful after the death of so many tenants. Farmers are able to increase their holdings and diversify their crops. Francesco, vieni giù ad aiutare. Non posso fare tutto da solo. Sì, papà. Italy's orchards point to a grisly fact. Sudden depopulation can benefit the survivors. As people died, wages rose. And as people died and lands were vacated, uh, people who 
in the past were relatively poor could afford to begin to invest in land. And what that meant was that all of a sudden people who had been peasants were now what we might call kulak class. They were now landowners. They had decent sized farms and they could actually live independent lives rather than working the fields of others. One of the interesting things is to look at the diet. Their diet, which is almost strictly grain-fed diet, uh, ale, uh, bread pudding, bread, now has quite a bit of meat in it, has some vegetables in it. La cena è pronta! Andiamo, figli! But as the prospects for peasants rise, large landowners struggle to maintain their incomes. For centuries, they have depended on serfs to work their estates. Now, with so many dead and so much cheap land on the market drawing the survivors away, some nobles now have to pitch in themselves. A clergyman gleefully notes how the mighty have fallen. Churchmen, knights, and other worthies have been forced to thresh their corn, plow their land, and perform every other unskilled task if they are to make their own bread. Ma che stai facendo? Ma come la stai usando quella zappa? Marito mio, giuro che te la faccio mangiare questa Ma guarda come stai zappando, se la usassi bene, non staremmo qua tutto il giorno. The Hundred Years' War, which rumbles on between England and France, gives opportunity to knights and adventurers alike. But for the peasants, it's more bad news. You have a lot of military types running around. Sometimes they're employed by France or England or Spain or Catalonia or someone, in which case they're drawing a salary and looting cities for pay. Sometimes they're unemployed and they're looting cities uh, to feed themselves. During the truces of the Hundred Years' War, many soldiers become bandits. Italy is riven by a massive influx of mercenaries on a quest for loot. We have all these demilitarized men roaming the land, uh, looking for opportunities to pillage. And that's really where things like scalping, for example, come from. Uh, it was these the terror tactics of these uh, groups of military men seeking to uh, extort from villagers and from city folk. The repercussions of a smaller workforce ripple through the more peaceful pursuits of craft, industry, and agriculture. Simply, the destruction of so many people forced uh, the survivors to come up with labor-saving devices such as the printing press. Industries that used to rely heavily on surplus manual labor, like the cloth industry, which used to be able to count on lots of dislocated peasants who didn't have land because there were so many people and land was fixed, they can't rely on that labor. So they start to turn to other kinds of solutions, technological solutions, like mills. A century after the Black Death, Gutenberg's printing press prompts the slow decline of the beautiful illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages. All the industries that we really associate with later processes of industrialization start to emerge in the late 14th century, and you could argue that they emerge partly as a response to the labor crisis precipitated by the plague. Perhaps the greatest impact is upon the human mind. A whole continent must be suffering from a form of shell shock. I can't even imagine the anguish that would have occurred from a parent uh, or a child watching a parent get sick. <coughs> Take young people who may have seen their parents die, surviving in the 1350s, but with that memory of death all around them, so that death became a common sight. Well, I think there is lots of evidence that uh, there was a psychological transformation affected by, uh, by the plague and by the sudden dramatic disappearance of so many people. 
death clings to their imaginations. He intrudes more and more into the art of the late medieval period, most famously in the dance macabre. The kind of Dutch paintings you see with skeletons dancing and with a kind of a memento mori, just remember death, death is everywhere. The psychological impact of the Black Death is unfathomable. But we know that the very foundations of medieval faith have been shaken. Amongst some circles, there is a new spirit of skepticism and questioning. The Renaissance, which flowered in Italy in the hundred years that followed, may have been encouraged by this new mode of thinking. It did demonstrate mankind's remarkable power of recovery. It was as if Europe had suddenly switched off and then back on again. And the Black Death had done that. Nothing before or since, no earthquake, no war, no famine, has ever caused such mortality. The ultimate enemy are microbes. And man has no reason to think that because of his superior intellect, if it really came down to a battle, he would necessarily win. The bacteria that causes bubonic plague is still at large in the world today. In Saudi Arabia, North and South Africa, parts of South America, and the United States. In 1900, following an outbreak of plague in China, the microbe hitched a ride on a merchant ship to California where bubonic plague erupted, killing 122. From the west coast, it traveled inland where it found a fertile new host population, the rodent communities of America's deserts and grasslands. It's in the southwestern part of the United States, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, California, some in Texas, Arizona. It's mainly in ground squirrels, chipmunks, uh, uh, prairie dogs, small rodent animals. Uh, it can infect other animals, and particularly cats. Cats, like humans, are very, very susceptible to plague, and they can develop plague pneumonia with cough, and they can spread the disease then to people. If the pet owner is handling the cat, has the cat up in their face, and the cat's coughing, they can get what we call primary pneumonic plague, which is acquired by inhaling the bacteria. When the Black Death ravages 14th century Europe, the only hope for a plague victim seems to be a miracle. Now, antibiotics can cure bubonic plague if the case is identified quickly enough. We're going to immediately tracing contacts, looking for whoever might have been in, in contact with this person might have been exposed. And then quite often these people get prophylactic antibiotics to make sure the disease doesn't spread. Yersinia pestis, the microbe that causes bubonic plague, is well known and understood. What worries disease watchers are the unknown microscopic killers, diseases hidden from us now, but that have the potential to emerge rapidly and race through a population. Things entering into the food chain, things changing hosts that you'd never dream would change hosts, things appearing in, in unlikely areas. AIDS, SARS, bird flu, and Lyme disease all have appeared in modern populations through a small and apparently innocuous development. Microbes are given an opportunity, and they take it. Lyme disease really was let loose because suburban uh, forests in, in the Northeast were being cleared for suburban sprawl. So it's the same phenomenon. I mean, we're doing that today. We don't know what agents we're gonna let loose. What if Ebola virus established a new home in the East Coast of the United States? That could be pretty awful. It's untreatable. It's unfortunately spread from patients to caretakers. It's the family taking care of them, the doctors, the nurses that come down with that disease. <coughs> and it's a very frightening disease in that respect. 
In the Middle Ages, the Black Death emerged from a remote region, traveling along trade routes to reach the entire civilized world with startling speed. Today, microbes can cross oceans and continents in a single day. When you think of the 24-hour period of travel, you realize that any virus in the world, anywhere, can be right here in this living room within one incubation period. It doesn't have to transmit to anybody, it doesn't have to go through a fleet, it doesn't have to do anything. Looking at the plague, there are a couple of things that jump out that parallel our situation. Um, you have the notion of an expanding economy, new trade routes. You realize that 500 million people every year cross international borders on international airline flights. 500 million a year. 70 million work outside their own country. I mean, the, the numbers are just, are just staggering of the amount of movement, the speed of that movement, and the density of the humans. Put that together, it's a setup. With only a basic grasp of medical science and hampered by religion and superstition, medieval physicians like Guy de Choliac are hopelessly unprepared for the Black Death. Many experts fear that when confronted with a catastrophic pandemic, modern science will be equally overwhelmed. If you took something like the plague of the 14th century, where people are dying in their homes, in the streets, and all over the place, I'm not sure we'd handle it, I, I hope we'd handle it better, but I'm not sure we'd handle it terribly much better than, than, the, than the people of the medieval period did. We don't have a lot of redundancy in the system. We don't have surge capacity, as they call it. If something goes wrong, you, you know, the capacity is not there to really handle it. There's absolutely no way that uh, organized health systems could um, cope with uh, an epidemic of the proportions of the Black Plague. The Black Death is a story of terror and violence, of frenzied and irrational responses to a disaster of beyond comprehension. But it is also one of tenacity and endurance and renewal. The plague is a kind of mirror in which we can actually see how a society coped with a clear medical human disaster. If this is true, the image is an alarming one. For man's ultimate enemy is still out there somewhere, no less deadly than it was 650 years ago. That it will awaken is inevitable. That we will be ready is not.